Hello everybody, it's Doc Cat here again and because we're getting fully into spring now and all the migrants are coming back, today we're going to talk about Shropshire's warblers. Now, warblers have for a long time been considered a rather difficult group. Uh, they're the ones that when you're going through your bird book, you get pages and pages of all these little birds that are sort of greeny, browny, greyy, fairly nondescript looking things. And for a long time, people didn't actually realise they were different species. Um, they all looked about the same. Um, Gilbert White in the 1700s was actually the first to realise that willow warblers, chip chap and wood warblers were actually three different species. Now, bird watching then wasn't really bird watching as we know it. And people worked out what a bird was mainly by shooting it. And then they looked at the dead remains and decided what it was. And Gilbert White was actually one of the first people who looked at birds live doing things in the field. And he realized that the three species actually had completely different songs. Um, of course, they didn't have binoculars then. Um, and if, I mean, if, if you couldn't see a bird really very well, all you could do was listen to it. And Gilbert White was a great bird listener. He was very good at obser observing behaviour. So basically dead specimens just don't sing. So everybody that had, a, I mean, even some of our best um, bird identifiers, if you gave them a dead chip chap or willow warbler, they might not know which it was. So he was absolutely brilliant at it. And he, of course, he wrote the Natural History of Selborne, and it's a wonderful book of his letters. And he was corresponding with bird watchers all over the country and telling them how he discovered that these, what they were called willow wrens at that point, were actually three different kinds of bird. The problem with them is shown by the, the vernacular name, the, the, what used to be the common names for these birds, which can cover several species. So things like nettle creeper or petty chap was covered a whole range of birds. So are they really that difficult? One way you can tell the difference is what it's doing, bird behavior. And this is a page from a wonderful book by Dominic Cousins called Identifying Birds by Behaviour. And I thoroughly recommend it to everybody because it tells, it, it, it gives you the other half of the jizz apart from just what it looks like, it's what it's doing, it's very important. So what it's doing, where it is, which habitats it's in, and also of course it's song. Uh, they're not called warblers for nothing. They do have lovely songs. So. We've got pictures and sound here. If you can't hear it or you want to listen to it again, the sound is all taken from a web website called Zeno Canto. And you can download the songs onto your own computer as MP3 files. So if you need to look at any of them again, listen to any of them again, um, you can do that. Now here is a black cap. And this is one of our commoner warblers. And it's one of the few ones that's actually fairly distinctive. It's got this little black hat. Um, it's also known as Northern Nightingale. They actually arrived a lot before Nightingales. Um, John Clare called them the, the, the March Nightingale. And they have a rather lovely song. There he goes. Usually starts with a fairly irresolute chat to him, and then you get these clear, slightly melancholy, fluky notes. Now, it's notoriously hard to tell from the garden warbler, but Actually, it's not that difficult. They do say, if you can see it, it's a black cap, and if you can't, it's a garden warbler. 
and the black cat sings from high in the crown or on a tall bush and they like broadleaf woodland and you can find it all over the county some of them over over winter here um but there's also birds that come across from central europe to winter in the uk so you will see them in the winter as well this is the female one and she doesn't have a black cap uh, she has a rust colored cap rather rather a lovely thing they will come to gardens in the winter and you'll see them particularly um if you put out suets they'll come come to suet blocks and suet pellets and also the garden fruits um lovely thing to see absolutely beautiful so this is the species that they say you will confuse the sound with it's a garden warbler and they arrive rather later early to mid-may and they overwinter in tropical western and southern africa so it takes them a little longer to get here the black caps have been down in the mediterranean so it's rather an anonymous looking bird it's, it, it, it's sort of plain brown little brown job sort of thing but notable really for its rather kindly expression it's got big dark eyes and a rounded head um, very hard to see it singing um, it avoids exposed branches and things from cover and they say that the sound this song sounds like a rippling brook it sounds like somebody having a conversation so let's see if i can if i can find the um there we are There we go, bubbling along. The name is a bit silly. You won't find it in your garden unless you've got huge thick shrubbery or woodland. Nice little bird there. Another of the Sylvia warblers, this is a common white throat. And this is one of the ones that was referred to as a nettle creeper, which tells you a bit about its habitat. Now, these ones like hedgerows and low bushy habitats and one of the ways you can spot it by its behavior is if you're walking down a lane quite often they'll make short flights along the lane ahead of you and then dive into cover and glare out at you in a rather baleful way um, these ones have a scratchy song they describe it as a scratchy or harsh song um, my, my brother always called them jazz warblers because they sound like a jazz singer in a bar, you know, sort of sounds like drunk, been drinking and smoking a bit too much. And Eric Hardy referred to it as ziggling. And so rather distinctive song. And they also have a song flight. So it's a short, jerky song flight, which looks like it's been suspended on an elastic thread. You manage it sort of bouncing up and down. So it's uh, quite a plain looking bird but once you've got the song in your head and that behavior you'll spot them little short scratchy sentences they're very very common until the last 30 years of the 20th century there was many pairs of them around as, as robins today and then there was a sudden crash in 1969 and three quarters of the population just never never came back after migration and they suffer from um the drought in the areas in sub-saharan africa and as they're coming back from migration they, they some of them they they don't can't survive if that area is very dry um fluctuating numbers of these the lesser white throat is an, another rather grayish white little bird this is a skulking thing they tend to lurk about in 
hedges and bushes and railway embankments and these sort of places. It nests in very dense bush. And this is one that's actually, unlike um, most of the other warblers, it overwinters in northeast Africa. So it goes the other way around the Mediterranean. It goes around the east end rather than across the west end. Um, it has a, a, a rather dry rattling song again and it doesn't doesn't have a song flight so if you if you don't see a song flight and you hear them rattling in a bush from cover this will be a lesser white throat there he goes short sentences again i do recommend you have a look online on that website zeno canto and listen to these again now now we're on to the phylloscopus warblers these are the leaf warblers the latin name actually means leaf searcher so these are the ones that are picking insects off leaves in the canopy of trees and um, this is a wood warbler it's rather, a, again, the little green, greeny, grey, browny bird, little yellow bits on it. And not all of them have these rather brightly coloured socks to make them easy to spot. A uh, lovely little bird, and you can see how it blends into the colour of the spring woodlands. So, quite hard to spot. It's quite a scarce summer visitor. Um, usually, in, you can find them in the southwest of the county. Um, in the woodlands and Shropshire Hills, and smaller populations around the Rekin. It's rather fussy. It likes woods with dense canopy and minimal undergrowth. So open beech woods are very good for these things. Um, it likes branches, tree branches less than three meters from the ground. It likes to fly down to its nest. A lot of the warblers nest very low down or on the ground. So this one is in, in low bush. Um, rather distinctive song one of them is described as like it's like a loud spluttering cadence like a spinning coin on a marble slab and the other a soft penetrating repeated whistle like a silver bugle i didn't make these descriptions up somebody else did and it sings from below the canopy rather than on an exposed perch forages high up in the canopy quite hard to see. So let's have a listen to this one and see if you can see the spinning coin sound. That's the silver bugle. Somebody else described it as sounding like dropping pearls on a silver plate. They get very poetic about these things. Now the willow warbler, this is one of our commonest warblers and um, it's very abundant. You'll find it all, anywhere there's a few trees and bushes, you'll find it. And um, this is declining. It's another one that overwinters in sub-Saharan Africa. So it, it has the same problems. And this one has quite a simple song, which is a, a descending cadence, which covers almost an octave. And has been described as having a compelling gentleness. I told you they were poetic about these things. Very difficult to tell from a chip chap if you if you don't hear it, but very similar. It's actually got rather paler legs, um, but they're very small differences. So listen to the song. It's also highly territorial, and you get these um, 
Dominic Cousins described it as, as a, a curious habit of suddenly flying after other birds in an apparent fit of fury. And no other warblers do this. They would say highly territorial, and that's them driving off any um, other bird from its territory. So, really, willow warblers, to me, the sound of spring, here it goes. Almost like a little arpeggio. Beautiful. Again, nests very low, nests on the ground. Is is look alike, the chip chap. Um, really looking at them, you wouldn't notice that that one has slightly darker legs, would you? But of course they're one of the first warblers to get here. Um, they're one of those ones that uh, the first one you hear singing, you go, oh wow, here they are, they're home, they're back. And spring is come. And then if you're in a place that has a lot of chip chats around, after a couple of days with them, you're going to want to bring their little necks. Um, they winter around the Mediterranean, so they get here early on, early in March. And there's an expanding population of non-migrant ones as well. But you won't see them in your garden then, not like the black caps. They, they rely on insects around net, uh, wetland areas to, to overwinter here. There's been a steady increase in them since 1997 and they're doing very well. So worth looking out for. The only trouble is they don't sing in the winter either. So actually spotting a wintering chaffinch can be quite difficult, uh, chip chap, sorry, can be quite difficult. Um, here we are, this is the bird saying its name. You say a couple of days of that and you're ready to ring its neck really. Um, this one's a sort of slightly more typical looking one. Again, rather a nondescript bird, but you wouldn't see them around gardens and you certainly hear them. And lovely picture here of a, of a flying one. And it's amazing, these birds with tiny little wings, all of the warblers, very small birds, very small wings, and they can migrate huge distances, um, which is really quite amazing. So that's the end of the leaf warblers, and now we're on to the acrocephalus warblers. This is, it means pointed head. They tend to look rather angular heads on them, the crown of the head. So this is a sedge warbler. And these ones are very particular about the habitat. Um, they're quite widespread. Um, they arrive earlier than the reed warblers, and they're not quite as reliant on, on, on the reeds. They breed as far north as Orkney, so there's a, a widespread in the, in the country, and again overwinter south of Sahara, and has the same fluctuating problems that are linked with the drought in the Sahel. And they tend to sing from the tops of the reeds, um, or a song perch, and they have a similar song to a reed warbler, but a bit faster, a bit louder. And it's been described as a sedge warbler as a noisy exhibitionist whereas the reed warbler is a stuttering introvert. Um, it also has a, has a song flight, unlike the reed warbler. So if you see one of these little brown birds in the reeds and it's taking a song flight, that's a sedge warbler. And it, it rises up chattering and then spirals down with outstretched wings and tail. It is showing off, basically. Um, these birds are also mimics. They'll, they'll incorporate all sorts of sounds into their song and they use phrases at random. So it never actually sings quite the same song twice. So here it goes. This is the said warbler.
chattering on quite happily. Some of the sounds of the central warbler sound a bit like somebody rubbing two pebbles together. You get that sort of chacking noise. The reed warbler is um, not as widespread as the sedge warbler, and they tend to be restricted to areas south of about the Wirral. Um, it's an increasing species, and it has a simpler song than the sedge warbler, more metrical. It really likes the Phragmites reed bed, so these are the tall reeds around um, lakes um, and ponds. It usually feeds about mid height. And it climbs around the stems quite dexterously, much much more so than a sedge warbler. So that's a, a behavioural thing you can watch out for. And they're not very shy. We did a, a, a dawn chorus walk in um, in the Cremorne Gardens in Ellesmere, and there was a reed warbler singing from the reed reed bed there, just on on the right as you as you go through the gates on the road. And it was chuntering away quite happily and we stood watching it for ages and it chuntered away and chuntered away and then we went right around the Cremon Gardens stopping to listen to all sorts of things and having a good time and then about an hour later, more than an hour later, we came back and it was still there in the same place and it was still chuntering on. So it's, um, they, 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 it was a fairly recently um, sort of planted reed bed. It didn't take them very long to find it at all. And um, there it was singing away in it. And this is what it sounds like. One a rather nice picture uh, of, of one with a, with a caterpillar for its chicks, and this is the nest of them right down within the reeds. So hard to spot, very cleverly made, rather nice little comfortable nest low down in the reeds. Um, they, they're great little birds, like I say, they'll chunter along quite happily. Now, this one is a, it's a bit of a cheat, really. Um, this is a, a, a marsh warbler, and I've put it in. They're not very, they're not common in Shropshire, really hard to find. Um, but I think the last one in Shropshire was at Prisley Lake in 2015. But I've put this one in because it's, it's a mimic. And this is one of the few birds that actually goes on learning its song after it's grown up, if you like. Most of them learn their song in the springtime when, from their own fathers and from neighbouring birds and then sort of work on them quietly themselves. And um, Marsh warblers go on learning their song as they migrate. So there'll be elements of African bird song in it. So if you hear the sound of a bulbul or something um, out, of, out, out, of, out of the reeds, or out, out of vegetation, it'll be a marsh warbler. Um, they don't like reed beds very much. Um, they're not very keen on vegetation growing out of water, but they like tall herbs near damp areas. So things like nettle beds and big stands of cow parsley or, or something like this, and they'll be quite happy in there. I'm sorry, I haven't got a recording of this one, but you can find one online. Here's another invisible bird. This is a grasshopper warbler. This is the Latin name for it is Locustella. It's a scarce bird, declining. They've gone down by nearly half in Shropshire since between from the last count, which end, end, ended in 1990, and the current atlas in 2008-15, down by nearly a half. It's another one that winters in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is shows you just how much um, difficulty these little birds have on migration. This one likes damp, tussocky, rough undergrowth and, and, and thickets. And it, 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 it sings from cover. It creeps around the ground vegetation. 
and it's hardly ever seen and it wasn't really recognized as a bird until quite late in the 1700s and a lot of people wouldn't even admit it was one then they thought it was an insect it it's it it, it can throw its voice so it's not necessarily in the bush that the sound is coming out of and it varies the volume by turning its head so quite confusing thing to listen to and it can sing 1400 double notes per minute and it sounds rather like a fishing reel rather more like a fishing reel than it does a grasshopper to be honest but here it goes this is it They can keep it up for ages. Birds don't have to sort of breathe in and out like we do. Their lungs are designed completely differently. So it can make a continuous reeling noise while it's breathing. So that's an amazing thing. And this one again is a bit of a cheat. This is a Chetty's warbler. And I don't think they've been recorded in Shropshire yet. I might, might be wrong on that one. Um, but it can watch this space. They're, they're spreading all over the country. They're residents, they're not migrants. And they, they, they're widespread across continental Europe and have been coming into this country um, in increasing numbers. And they, there are populations of them up round, round the Wirral. So it's not that we're too far north, it's just that I think perhaps they haven't, perhaps haven't been recorded. So listen out for a Chetty's Warbler. They sing by night and they sing in the winter. So quite different behaviour really. <clears throat> this is, they also like, they like damp places, but it likes to forage on or near ground level. And so they avoid vegetation that's actually growing in the water. So they're not a reed bed species, but they're associated with reed beds. They like to be near water. Of course, there's a lot of insects near water, so it's always a good place to be an insectivorous bird like all these warblers are. And their song is wonderful. They almost tell you how, who they are. If you listen to the little phrase, the beginning of it sounds like me, Chetty. So let's have a listen to the Chetty's warbler, and you can listen out for them and see if you can record one in Shropshire for us. <laughs> they're rather distinctive way of sitting with their tail cocked up a bit uh, otherwise again rather a nondescript little bird but um they're really quite lovely in their own way and they're very distinctive call um the, the county bird recorders tend to not accept them unless you've heard them so do have a listen out for these ones they're absolutely lovely so that's really all the warblers you get in Shropshire, apart from this last one, which you don't, and the marsh warbler, which is very scarce vagrant. But other ones will turn up. Um, these warblers can, can arrive and then disappear again in passage, on migration, blown off course. And um, most people wouldn't know they were a different, different breed. They keep, twitches are very keen on them because you can get all sorts of things, even New World warblers pitching up. There's about 350 species of Old World warbler that's in um, Europe and, and Africa. Um, so plenty of them could overshoot or end up here, but those are our common ones. And do watch out to see if we can get some Czechic warblers, because they're great. This is... Um, a map of Africa. This is just to talk about the threats that these 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 birds are facing, and most a lot of the declining ones tend to be coming from south of the Sahara, and this sort of pinky-coloured band is the Sahel. And if that 
that area suffers terrible periodic drought, um, particularly with the climate change we're experiencing now. And of course, it adds you know, maybe a third onto the journey over desert. So any drought in the Sahel this could, could impact on, on the birds' ability to migrate properly, successfully, in fact. Um, they would normally stop and feed themselves up in the Sahel and then cross Sahara at night when it's cooler. Um, but just adding that bit extra, if the Sahel is drought stricken, can mean they haven't got the fuel to make it right across. So it's climate change can be a, a, a really big problem for these small birds. They can't carry that much fat reserve. So they're really populations are badly hit when, when these areas dry up. And increasingly, drought in sub Saharan Africa is more regular. So, danger on migration is huge. Not only do they have to come all the way to South Africa they, and, and, and possibly perish crossing the desert, but then they've got to get across the Mediterranean and they're hit by hunting. And Cyprus, Sardinia, Italy, these places have a tradition of hunting small songbirds. Um, this is uh, a, a black cap on, on a lined stick in Cyprus. Um, only 7% of the, the hunting of these birds is actually for subsistence reasons. They're mostly sold as a luxury food item. Um, 5.6 million birds killed in Italy every year. These small songbirds. Um, there's, it's not as if there's lots of food on them. <laughs> it's like they're buffaloes or something. Over 150 species are killed in significant numbers every year around the Mediterranean. It's illegal, but it's commercial. And the excuse for it is that it's cultural. So, is it the mist netting for them, liming for them, and they collect these tiny little birds and um, eat them. If you really want to look after warblers, these are they, they, they could be the ones that are going to nest in your garden or the, the, the woods next to your garden. Um, support bird life cypress, they're campaigning really hard to make. I mean, it's illegal already, but to actually police that. If you go to Italy, Sardinia, somewhere like that, the name for a dish of warblers is Ambello Puglia. And if it's on the menu, don't eat them, <laughs> don't order them. And personally, I wouldn't have eaten a restaurant that was actually offering them. What we can do in this country, obviously, you know, we don't hunt them, but habitat loss and habitat fragmentation can still affect their breeding success. So we need to look after places like the reed beds, this was at, at, at Wood Lane, and it's always full of sedge and reed warblers. So look after the places they're breeding, the woodlands they're breeding in, the, the, the reed beds, these, these lovely open beach woodlands um, with, 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 remember the wood warblers particularly like, up in the crowns of, crowns of the trees, they'll be foraging away there. So we need to look after the habitat for them here, as well as campaigning for um, policing of the hunting ban in places like Malta. It, they have a very complicated life, these migrants, and they're reliant on having their breeding grounds safe, their migration route and their stopover places safe, and also their wintering grounds. So their world isn't just here. They're not our birds, they're right down into Africa. So all of that needs preservation. Best thing you can do to help look after the habitats is of course, join us today. Um, those of you who've watched 
a lot more of my talk you'll be used to this bit you can turn off now but if you haven't do have a think about it just think a plate of ambello puglia would cost you around 35 pounds in a restaurant in italy which is 10 times as much as a month's subscription to Shropshire Wildlife Trust. So make a difference. Join us today and just think, instead of buying that plate of poor little birds, you could look after the habitats that they need to breed in all over Shropshire. Thank you very much.